Okay, hovers. <coughs> Wait, there's a lot of pollution in here. <coughs> I better go someplace with clean air. <coughs> better. from cars and jeepneys are common pollutants in our air. And air pollution is really bad for our lungs because it affects our breathing. Have you noticed, K Hubbers, that it's harder to breathe when the air is filled with smoke from smoke belching vehicles? It's because breathing is a process of exchanging clean air for used air. And when the air we inhale is not clean, parts of our body get hurt and break down, making it much harder for us to breathe. Let's listen to Professor Maria Rosario Wood, former chairperson of the Science and Biology Department of Miriam College and an active member of the Philippine Network on Climate Change, to find out which of our essential body parts are especially affected by the air we breathe. Hi, Ms. Wood. Hi, Hi Sam. <coughs> oh. Are you okay? Oh, Luis, come drink some water. Thank you, Mom. I Welcome. feel better now. What happened? Oh, Luis was laughing and eating at the same time. So a piece of his popcorn went right through his windpipe. That caused him to choke. But, Mom, doesn't all the food we eat pass through our throat to get into our body? Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, solid food we eat and liquid we drink gets right into our throat. As well as the air we breathe, the solid food gets into a different pipe we call esophagus, and it gets into another pipe we call the trachea. So, ma'am, instead of going down my esophagus, mm -hmm. the food I just ate went the other way? That's right. How does the food know which pipe to go to if the esophagus and the trachea has the same opening? There is a, what we call a flap of tissue, we call the piglitis, that controls the opening and the closing of the trachea. So when we swallow anything solid, that closes the trachea, and then the rest of the food will go down to the esophagus. Mom, if they both start on our throats, where do these two different pipes end? Well, to understand all of these things better, we have to learn the entire respiratory system. Ventilation, or simply breathing, allows air to get in and out of the lungs. Breathing consists of two stages. Inspiration, for inhalation, which is the act of moving fresh supply of air into your lungs. And expiration, for exhalation, is the act of moving air out of the lungs to get rid of carbon dioxide that is not needed by your body. External respiration, the second phase, is the exchange of gases between the atmosphere and the blood, while internal respiration, the third phase, is the exchange of gases between the blood and the body tissues. This occurs in all living cells. How do these relate to choking? Well, the trachea we mentioned earlier is part of the entire respiratory system. And of course, it includes the nose. We have the pharynx. 
the larynx. The bronchi. And the bronchioles. And of course, we have the abdominal complex. Now let's go through the respiration process and let's begin with the nose. When you breathe, air enters your nose. The nostrils serve as entrances to your nasal cavities. They are a pair of passageways separated by a bony septum. Inside the right and the left nasal cavities are coarse hairs that filter the air and trap any microorganism or dust particles that may enter your nose. This ileated mucous membrane is richly supplied with blood capillaries capable of warming and moistening the air that is breathed in. This image of your delicate lung tissues. Next is our pharynx. It serves as passageway for both air and food. Pharynx forms an entrance to both the respiratory and the digestive tracts. Next comes the larynx. Your larynx lies in a small cable muscle in the front of your neck, a little below the back of your tongue. It is protected by a tough layer of cartilage. The entrance to this cable muscle is protected from the food you eat by the epiglottis we talked about earlier. As mentioned, the air goes down the windpipe or trachea. It is a tough muscular tube supported by rings of cartilage, which keep the tube from collapsing. It is also lined with cilia and fluid that trap germs and other materials from the air. The trachea branches out and forms the bronchial tree. This branch passage of air is embedded in your lungs. Bronchi are two smaller pipes from your trachea. One leads to your right lung, the other to your left. They again branch into smaller and smaller tubes within your lungs. The smallest branches finally lead a cluster of microscopic, balloon-like air sacs, the alveoli. Alveoli are surrounded by tiny blood vessels or capillaries. Its walls are thin and moist. That is why gases can easily diffuse across the membrane of the alveolus. We already know that the lungs are in our chest. But we don't know why these two lungs aren't the same size. Well, yes, you're right. The left lung is always a little smaller than the right lung. And that's simply because it has to give some space for the heart. Lungs are spongy and are covered by a double pleural membrane which secretes mucus. The mucus acts as a lubricant, permitting the lungs to move freely in the chest during breathing. When the diaphragm moves down and your ribs spread, your lungs are stretched. At this point, air flows in through your nose and windpipe to fill the extra space. After some time, your diaphragm relaxes and your lungs are squeezed back to the original size. At this condition, much of the air is forced out. Ma'am, why does your breathing vary from time to time? Well, uh, respiratory movements like inhalation and exhalation vary with your body's activities. So, when you are doing strenuous exercise, you're playing ball, basketball, swimming, what happens is that you need more body weight air to cut it in and out of your respiratory system, and therefore, the frequency as well as the intensity of your inhalation and your exhalation also changes. This ensures and during strenuous activity, greater air volume flows into your lungs and more oxygen is delivered to your worked up body cells. The control of breathing is partly voluntary and partly involuntary. You can hold your breath anytime you want. You can hyperventilate or take several deep, fast breaths. However, 
If you can do these activities for an extended time, your brains take over to regulate your breathing. What happens next when the cells have finally used the oxygen they need from the air we breathe? Carbon dioxide must now leave the cells of our body. You are correct, Samantha. And the process of discharging waste from the body is known as excretion. The excretory system is made up of the lungs, the skin, the kidneys, and their associated organs. Solutes may be lost through urination, respiration, and sweating, while water may evaporate through the lungs and sweating. Excretion therefore refers to the removal, mainly in the kidneys, of cellular waste that collects in tissue fluids and the blood. For the body to function normally, a balance in the volume and the concentration of the fluids should be achieved at any point of time. And this is possible only through the function of the urinary system. The urinary system is composed of two kidneys, the blood vessels linked to them, and the tubules that channel the fluid within the kidneys out of the body. The kidneys are the major organ of the human urinary system. They are mainly responsible for blood filtering to remove substances which are no longer needed by the body and to reabsorb substances which the body can still be used. The kidneys work through their basic functional unit, the nephrons. Each nephron extends from the outer part of the kidney, called the renal cortex, to the inner part, called the renal medulla. If nephron is the kidney's basic functional unit, what specifically are its functions? And what does it look like? Nephrons, to begin with, produce urine. And these very tiny tubules are actually housed in the kidney in very compact manner. It is extremely difficult to identify nephrons if you examine a dissected kidney without the aid of a hand lens since these structures are so narrow and densely packed. Each kidney contains about 1 million nephrons. The long tubule of a nephron is coiled and has closely associated blood vessels along the entire length. The nephron loop or the loop of Henle is the U-shaped region of the nephron tubule where the capillary and tubule walls seems to merge as one structure. The blind end of the tubule push in on itself to form a cup-like structure called the glomerular capsule or Bowman's capsule. This capsule surrounds the glomerus, which is a bowl of capillaries. The other end opens in to the collecting ducts that converge in the central cavity of the kidney called the renal pelvis. Urine that collects in this space is funneled out of the kidney. Secretion occurs in the distal tubules, which extends from the loop of Henle to the collecting duct. You're correct, Vincent. And some substances in the blood of the surrounding capillaries are constantly pumped into the filtrate by the cells of the tubules. Where does the actual waste removal from the blood take place? Oxygenated blood enters the kidney through the renal artery. In the kidney, these artery branches and rebranches to form arterioles. Each arteriole terminates in the glomerulus. Glomerulus is a mass of capillaries found in the Bowman's capsule that form a coiled knob-like end of every arteriole. and the renal vein, which branches out and carries blood away from the kidney. This is where the first stage of waste removal from the blood takes place.
Urine is formed in three stages. First, glomerular filtration. Second, tubular reabsorption. And the third, tubular secretion. Much of the blood content leaves the bloodstream and enters the Bowman's capsule. When the fluid leaves the capsule through the tubules, it passes through a network of capillaries. Here, nutrients and salts substances are reabsorbed at the convoluted tubules to be returned to the blood. Only nitrogenous waste, excess water, and mineral salts pass through the tubules to the pelvis of the kidneys as urine. What comes after that, ma'am? What comes after? The glomerulus liquid waste that poured into the pelvis and collected from each kidney pass through a long hollow tube called the ureter. This process may be viewed as helping to rid the body of waste. There is one ureter for each kidney. The ureters are about the size of a macaroni strand. Urine passes through your set of ureters and gets stored in a reservoir called urinary bladder. It is like a bag. When it is filled with urine, it is round and projects upwards. The passageway called urethra is found at the lower end of your urinary bladder. Urine gets expelled through the urethra upon contraction of the muscular bladder. Wow! <laughs> Every time we inhale air and get rid of our body's waste, dozens of our body parts work together. Yeah, I mean, without us ever thinking about them. <laughs> and now that we know, we can use this information to take care of our bodies better. Yeah, like not talking and laughing while eating. <laughs> Good job, students. You all learned very fast. <laughs> Our respiratory system is amazing. It allows us to take in fresh air and get rid of stale air. But because our body organs are responsible for regulating other organs, the respiratory system needs the help of our excretory system to totally flush out wastes in our body. Exercising strengthens our lungs. Drinking plenty of water and going to the bathroom when you need to go, on the other hand, are the best ways to keep our urinary tract healthy. Which reminds me, I have to go and find a restroom. See you later, K-Hubbers. Bye!